welcome to Red Eyes Radio, ladies and gentlemen, new or regular listeners. Uh, it is always great to have you with us. My name is Henrik, and the website is redeyescreations.com. The uh, place to go if you want to know more about our radio program and follow along in our frequently updated news uh, on uh, and about all the things that we think is uh, worth some of your um, attention, uh, some of the topics and areas that we think are very, very interesting and important to keep an eye on. Uh, on our website, you can also find videos, webcast, films, and uh, video interviews uh, that we have available up there for you. So do check it out. It's redeyescreations.com. Uh, today, we are going to spend some time talking about life after death. We're going to discuss quantum physics, uh, precognitive dreams, psychic resonance, uh, neurology of time perception. And uh, we might go into a little bit later as well uh, about the mystery of the photon. We had a lot of things to discuss today with author Anthony Peake. Um, he has written a book called Is There Life After Death? and uh, also another book titled The Daemon. Um, the website that you can take a look at is simply anthonypeake.com and the, the last name is spelled P-E-A-K-E. So it's anthonypeake.com. Uh, you can also take a look at his blog, uh, which you can reach at uh, sheetingtheferryman.blogspot.com. We will have these uh, links up on our website so you can find them easily. Um, and we have quite a few, uh, many, many different areas here to discuss today. So let's bring uh, on our guest right away and get this program uh, started. Uh, welcome to Red Eyes Radio, Anthony. Very nice of you to uh, come on our program today. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Uh, we're very glad to have you here. Uh, thank you for spending some of your time with us. Uh, I would like to, um, as a way of introduction uh, here at the beginning, maybe you can tell us just a little bit of, about some of the areas and, and, and research that you've been doing, uh, both through books, of course, but give us an outline um, of, of some of the main areas that you've been looking into. And I guess we can call it kind of your main uh, thesis or main theory, Anthony. OK, the, the theory behind both of my books, I, I term it cheating the ferryman. Now, by cheating the ferryman, what I mean is that probably you guys who are aware of the ancient Greek myths, um, will know the story of the River Styx and the idea of Charon the boatman. Now, what you probably are not aware of is that in ancient Greek times, what used to happen was that the, the family of the deceased person would place a small coin called an obelus underneath the tongue of the recently deceased person. The reason they would do this is the obelus was supposed to be a payment because when the person found themselves in the netherworld, as it were, they would find themselves in front of a river and the mists would open and a boatman would appear. And they would realize that they'd have to pay the boatman to cross the river Styx into the land of the dead, Hades. And what they do is they take the coin and they pay the, the, the ferryman and the ferryman would take them over to the land of no return. Now, what I suggest in my theory is that, like most myths, there is a, a grain of truth, a, a story within the story there. And I suggest that something very peculiar happens to human consciousness at the point of death, which allows us to cheat the ferryman. We don't pay him. It was interesting when you mentioned that I deal with um, life after death. That's probably a misconception because I don't. I deal with a potential scientific scenario that suggests that we may all be immortal and we in fact never die because we never get to the point of death. Uh, and that is the idea of cheating the ferryman. Now, what is even more interesting about the, this, this ancient myth is that it also used to be believed, and this is little known, the ancient Greeks also believed that you could, under certain circumstances, return back to life and live your own life again. And it's a very important point. This doesn't mean reincarnation. What the ancient Greeks believed, particularly the Stoics, was that you would go back and live your own life, a literal recreation of your own life from the moment of your birth to the moment of your death. Hmm. Now, in order to do that, you had to drink the waters of another river, which was called the Lethe. L-E-T-H-E. And that was called the river of forgetting. And the idea was that you would drink the waters and you'd go back to live your life again, having completely forgotten you've lived it before. Now, in effect, that's what my theory, Cheating the Ferryman, suggests. The reason, well, explain, it's difficult to explain, but effectively what I've done is I've gone into the science 
the hard science, the neurology, what happens to the brain at the point of death. Mm. I've been dealing with a new form of science called consciousness studies, which deals with how the human brain processes reality, how the human brain presents reality to whatever's inside our head that we call me or I. Um, I'm also dealing with um, the phenomenon known as near-death experience yes. and what happens when you have a near-death experience. I'm also dealing with certain neurotransmitters in the brain called glutamate. And all these things tie in together for the most amazing explanation for not just near-death experience, but virtually every single unusual phenomenon that most people report. Indeed, my book was recently reviewed in Fortean Times, uh, the international magazine, by Bob Rickard, who was the founder. And Bob Rickard gave the book nine out of ten. And he said it was a simply amazing, completely refreshing new idea about the nature of consciousness and the nature of reality. It's really, really very, very powerful stuff. Hmm. Very interesting. And you, of course, contacted me in regards to uh, some of the work that uh, Jim Elvich has done, who we had on the, the show yes. talking about the possibility that we might be living in a in a programmed reality. And is, is that a theory that you think is, is, is viable in that sense? Or are you still considering that this is a, a, an organic process still in one way and, and the brain is the decoder of this uh, of, of the program, so to speak? I think that uh, Jim's theory and mine are very, very similar in many, many ways. In fact, um, you may be aware that um, there has been a book written called The Physics of Immortality. And this deals with exactly the same idea that um, humanity uh, over millions and millions of years will evolve to being having computing power so powerful that they can recreate the past and they can recreate in a computer program every living being that has ever existed and we could be existing within that program and this again is written by you know a top physicist um it, it, it's not and his name escapes me but i think it's um i think it's wheeler mm. who came up with this idea mm -hmm. i may be wrong on that but i need to check on that but effectively it, it, i think the organic theory which i'm coming from and the machine theory that Jim suggests have so much synergy, I think effectively we're probably using the terminology wrongly. I think that effectively it's the same thing because I argue that we are existing in a three-dimensional recreation of our lives that is generated by the brain using probably digital techniques and holography because um, I argue that the world we are living in or 70% of us in the sense that if you get a deja vu sensation, you're living in the illusion. If you don't get deja vus, which 30% of individuals don't, you're, re you're putting down the records for the first time. Hmm. If you're living in the illusion, the term I use for this illusion is called the Bohmian IMAX. And I use this term because there is a, a, an American, or was an American scientist philosopher called David Bohm. And David Bohm died around about 15, 20 years ago, I think. But he he came up with some phenomenal theories about the nature of reality and the reality below the reality, something he called the implicate order. But effectively, I argue that his theories were valid and that we are all existing in this illusion, a bit like the Matrix movies, I suppose. Right, right. Well, that's an analogy that keeps coming up. And uh, I guess it's a good one. Do, do you think that um you know in in regards to time and and i guess we can talk about this from the perspective of deja vu again do you think that um we can break out from the illusion during this lifetime or can we only do that then at that point of death we're talking about the the ferryman again that you don't that you don't pay him and in that sense you're gonna break out of the illusion or how does it work I think the issue with time is a subtly different thing, and it's um, there's I've I've put a, a few postings on my forum over the last few days on the very issue of time perception. I suppose because I'm building up, because I'm doing a, um, a platform event at the National Theatre in London um, on the 24th of July, and I'll be on stage with particle physicist Professor Jeff Forshaw, and in that I'll be discussing time its perception, the psychology of time, the philosophy of time, and the nature of time itself, when you take into account 
uh, the, the latest implications from particle physics. And the idea that time in the, in the world of particle physics doesn't exist. Time, time is an illusion. It's a mind created illusion. So therefore, we could be existing in many, many different types of time. I always use the analogy of people and I say, you know, you wake up in the morning, the alarm clock goes off and then you put it on doze for two or three minutes. You go back to sleep and you can have a whole dream in that short period of time when the alarm goes off again. Mm -hmm. It's as if time dilates and the brain can dilate time. I cite an amazing example, um, which was uh, written up about 100 years ago by a guy called Alfred Maury, who was a French psychologist. And Maury, when he was a very young man, had a really long dream, and he dreamt that he was in the French Revolution. And initially, he was a member of the, the, the Robespierre clique, and he fell foul of them. And they had a whole story about his life and he falls foul of them and he ends up being tried. And there's this massive show trial that he dreams about that he lives through. He defends himself. He's found guilty. He's driven through the streets of Paris in a tumbrel. He's taken to the, the Place de la Concorde, uh, the Place de la Bastille, I suppose. And he is about to be guillotined. Mm. He places his head on the guillotine. And as he does so, he feels the guillotine hit on the back of his neck. And what had he woke up and what had happened was the bread, the, the board, the bread, the, the bed board had fallen and hit him on the back of the neck. Mm. He'd back created a whole dream based upon something that had happened instantaneously. That's the power of the brain. And that is the power and the, the illusion of time. As, as Buddhists say and philosophers say, you can break out of time by getting yourself into certain mental states. Mm. So time is an illusion. That's very interesting. I recognize that thing with the dream because they're, they're, I've had that experience myself many times when you <clears throat> hear a noise in the quote unquote real world and then uh, that is incorporated instantaneously into the dream and it starts to uh, work itself uh, to, together in, in unison with the dream. And um, for example, the alarm bell or whatever it might be, I think there is even actually one of those scenes in the Matrix where the alarm bell goes off, right? And he wakes up yes. to that. Um, what, what do you think it's... what? what what does that mean to you in that regard? Does it mean that um, we can, um, you know, ex experience, um, or rather, what we experience here is just um, hasn't to do anything with time? If if we think about it in terms of aging or, I guess, biological decay, that's just is that just part of the program that we're experiencing, and, we, and can we even break free from that? Or what do you think? There's a possibility we may do. I mean, the issue I have with that is that. I suppose we're getting into areas of supposition. What I always try to do is to stay as best I can within the science in that we, on my forum and on my blog site, we play around with theories and we will come out and spin out with these ideas all over the place. But effectively, if we can't show it to be scientifically valid, we tend to put it to the side and we tend to put it as part of philosophy or theology. Not not saying that philosophy and theology is not important, but it's a different way of viewing things. What we're trying to do with cheating the ferryman um, is to try and come up with a, a solid base theory that we can take to scientists who will turn around and say, well, yes, it does make sense. Indeed, we have particle physics on my particle physicists on my forum. Um, and I'm in touch with quite a few particle physicists around the world as well, because they're very intrigued by the implications for particle physics, for the things we're doing at the moment and the, the ideas we're generating. But I have to keep stressing to everybody listening out there. This is a theory. Yes. It is nothing more than that. It's it was um, how it started was. And I suppose that's where we're, we're needing to move to now is that around about 10, 11 years ago, I, I, I wanted to write a book, but I didn't know what I wanted to write about. It's one of these curious driving feelings I had that I needed to write a book. And the thing that really drew me in was deja vu. Because I really wanted to know exactly what deja vu was as a sensation, what it really meant neurologically, and was there an explanation for it? I mean, do you get deja vus? Um, I used to have them a lot, actually, more than I do these days. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably ended a few years ago, but uh, very rarely these days. Do you mind me asking how old you are? Uh, I'm 29. 
Uh, that's interesting. You you are very much in keeping with the how the statistics go. As you get older, the number of deja vus drops off. Hmm. And indeed, they only start coming back again when you start to get towards the end of your life. As you as you get towards middle age, not that you're middle aged in any shape or form yet, you're still a young man. Hmm. But effectively, as you 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 get towards middle age, they, they cease, seem to cease. They seem to stop. And there's a very good reason for that. And it is, it's going right into the nub of my theory because, and this is where I, I bounce off into all kinds of places, by the way, because that's what I do, because the, the theory is so huge, we can go off into any path you want. But effectively, the reason why that happens is that when you live your life again for the second or third or fourth, however many times you live your life in the final seconds of your real life, when you're living within the Bohmian IMAX, it's like watch it's like living within a supercomputer game that all the obvious all the all all the events have been pre-programmed in. You know the way when you play a um um a first person computer game, everything's programmed, so any choice you make is already within the program. Yes. I argue that's the same with the Bohemian IMAX, that there is every single option that can be taken in your life has already been taken by a version of you. Again, it gets complex here, but within the Everett Many Worlds interpretation of particle physics, mm -hmm. there is literally millions and millions of Henriks and Antonys having this conversation. <laughs> and we're all living in slightly different universes. Now, all those universes are out there, like as the term the uh, Argentinian writer George Borges called it, the Garden of the Forking Paths. There are all these paths out there that we can follow. Now, we can change those paths if we listen to the subject of my second book, which is a being I call the daemon, which is your own higher self. This is the part of you that remembers you've lived this life before. OK, mm -hmm. it's like a passenger in your head that knows the route. Daemon means so uh, like walking, doesn't it? Like someone who is um, walking into someone or like the, the overarching uh you can get possessed by a daemon, right? Or no, so this is this is this is interesting in terms of the semantics. The word daemon is spelled D A E M O N right. as I use it. And a daemon in that sense is from ancient Greek philosophy and Gnostic philosophy. And the daemon is your own higher self. It is not an evil being. Sure, sure. The reason the, the reason that the word daemon became demon was literally it was demonized um because when Christianity took over, um, not that I'm denigrating Christianity in any way or shape or form, but effectively they they needed to denigrate the old religions. And one of the things they used was to change the concept of the daemon, the demon, the daemon to being a demon. The higher self. Another, the higher self. Mm. Now, the Romans used a similar term. They called it the genius. Um, so it's a subtle difference there. But I think the daemon works very, very effectively because the daemon is your higher self and the edelon, which is the, you and I are edelons. We are people living our life in a linear way through our lives without knowing the future. But we all have inside us this being, this other part of ourselves, which knows the future. Hmm. Now, going back to the reason why deja vu ceases as you get older or come less, is that as you're living your life for the second time, for argument's sake, there will be a point where your daemon will either save your life or will do something that will make you do something that you didn't do last time. Now, in my second book, I have example after example after example of this, both from my readers and from history of individuals who who are saved by a voice in their head. Something warns them right. to not take this road. Now, the interesting thing is, if, for instance, you are driving, let's use the analogy, you're driving along a road and your daemon realizes that if you travel along that road, there's going to be a terrible car crash and you're going to be killed. What the daemon does, depending upon how well it can communicate with its lower self or edelon, it will warn you. And it will either warn you by giving you a hunch, you know, this doesn't feel right, I need to turn off the road. It may even speak to you. And I have evidence of people whose daemons have spoken to them to warn them about things. Hmm. One, one South African guy who lives in South Africa, who's, who's Zimbabwean Rhodesian, his life was saved in 1969 uh, in northern Rhodesia 
when he was a soldier because a voice in his head as he came round a corner in an armoured vehicle shouted to him and said, ambush, 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 just this voice in his head. Mm. He didn't react. So, the, so something pushed him off the top of his armoured vehicle just as the bullets crashed into the back of his seat, mm. saved his life. Now, going back to our analogy, that means that at that point, that man's life was changed forever because in his last life run, he was killed. The next life run, suddenly it's a new life. He's turned off, metaphorically off the road. So in which case it means that your daemon no longer knows what's going to happen next because it's a new life and you won't remember it subliminally. So you don't get any more deja vus because suddenly your life's different. Do I make sense there? You know, that you can only remember something if you've experienced it before. Right, right. See what you mean. Yeah. But if your daemon changes it, suddenly your daemon and yourself have turned off the road and you're on a new route. And the, the deja vus only really start again when your daemon, when you get towards the end of your life, your daemon starting to prepare you for going round the Bohmian IMAX again. And it starts to give you hints. And that's when it starts to manifest these strange sensations. You know, like you hear people get ideas they're going to die. There is, the, the, for instance, in Eastern Europe, European legend, there's the myth of the doppelganger. Yes. The idea you see your own double, you're going to die. That's the daemon warning you, you are about to die. It manifests itself and it warns you to get ready to die or to approach death, to go around and live your life again. Does this all make sense? Because I'm, I'm bringing in information from lots of places. It's, I think it's very, very interesting hearing about this. And, and one thing I want to ask you about is in regards to these millions of different versions that you mentioned before that you and I can have this conversation, but in multiple you know, versions, millions of versions. Um, yep. Do you think then that it's possible to kind of, uh, I don't know if this is the right word, but choose your timeline, meaning that you can actually jump from one place into another, which means that let's say it, that you do have an accident or something like that and, and that you actually are killed in one of these versions, uh, but but you are going to choose the one where you actually continue to live in order to have the, the full experience yeah. or whatever it might be. Does that make sense? Or it, it, No, it does exactly make sense. And that's exactly what the, the, the whole cheating the ferryman theory is, the basis of that, is that your daemon, because your daemon knows what's going to happen, it effectively makes the choice for you. So the daemon will warn you and will allow you to continue existing in a different universe, not the universe that you died in. And you move across into an alternative universe. And this can happen many, many times in your life, because effectively, if every possible life that you can live exists, I use this analogy in my second book. I say to people when they're reading the book that there are as many versions as of them as there are words in the book. Because there will be a version of them that would read so far in the book and stop. Hmm. And the, so literally everything that you can live. And again, your listeners may say, oh, come on, this is nonsense. This is not. This is science. This is the only way at the moment that particle physicists can explain the behavior of subatomic particles is by using this thing called the Everett Many Worlds Interpretation. They have two options. Either the universe is created by the action of a conscious being observing it. Yes. Or the universe splits into millions of copies of itself a second. Hmm. There is no other options except the possible third option, which is David Bohm's implicate order. But my theory incorporates all three of these. I think that in d different circumstances, all three theories are valid. Hmm. Because, for instance, have you heard of Schrodinger's cat? Absolutely. But tell us, uh, for, for the audience that might not uh, be familiar with this. Okay. Schrodinger's cat. Erwin Schrodinger was a physicist in the 1930s. And he, he had profound problems with um, the latest ideas at that time of particle physics, something called the Copenhagen interpretation, which was something put forward by a guy called Niels Bohr, and his associates, ironically enough, in Copenhagen, although recently I've discovered that it was it was suggested first in Belgium in something called the Solvay Conference. But what Bohm said in, in, in principle is that all particles, electrons, um, photons, uh, even they've discovered recently even atoms, 
these things can be a wave and a particle depending upon whether they are observed or not yes in, in fact as you know light can be both a wave and a particle and what they found is the thing that makes a wave which is a wave in something else become a particle which is a point object like a photon is the act of observation by either a machine or by a conscious mind okay mm -hmm. now schrodinger came along and said this is utterly ridiculous as uh, and schrodinger was very much in agreement with einstein on this as einstein once turned around and said this is utterly ridiculous it implies that if i look away the moon isn't there anymore <laughs> right. which is what which is the implications of what neil Niels Bohr was saying yes it's the idea of the light in the fridge. You know, if you close the fridge door, is the light on or off? We'll right. never know. Same kind of analogy. So what Schrodinger said was, look, I've come up with this thought experiment. And what we do is we'll place a live cat in a box and we'll seal that box so nobody can see inside it. And inside that box, there will be a, a, sensitive, um, uh, a small hammer and underneath the hammer will be a file of a poison cyanide okay and the hammer will be attached to a sensor and that sensor will will trigger depending on whether a particular subatomic particle decays or not now what they do is they would calculate that they know that in the next hour this particle will either decay or not okay yeah now schrodinger used the argument that if that particle needs the act of an observer to observe it. It will it will decay during that hour that the cat's in the box. But until the box is opened, you won't know whether it will have decayed or not. And mm. the act of observation will it effectively decide whether it decays or not. So Schrodinger argued that that means that for some time during that hour inside that box, the file of cyanide will either have been broken or not, which means that the cat in the box will be both alive and dead at the same time. Yes. And in fact, inside the box will be a live cat and a dead cat until somebody opens the box and observes it. And what is called collapses the wave function of the particle eroded, uh, the, the decomposed. And until that point, the cat is both alive or dead. And Schrodinger said, that's ridiculous. You can't possibly have that kind of scenario. The irony is that they've now done experiments very, very similar. And guess what? There is an alive and dead cat in the box, metaphorically. And Hugh Everett III, in 1957, an American PhD student, came up with a solution. And he said, when the box is opened, one person sees a live cat and one person sees a dead cat. So at the point the box is opened, there are two observers, not one, mm. which implies that at every act of a, whatever a subatomic particle does, both options are fulfilled within what's called the multiverse. The implications of that are astounding because it effectively means that since the first moment of the Big Bang, every single event has split into another event and multiplied ridiculously which means by implication that there are trillions and trillions of Earths inhabited by trillions and trillions of us having this conversation. So that means it's very simple that you and I could fulfill or a version of us could fulfill every possible outcome of our lives. Mm. Indeed, somebody recently said in an article I read, again, hard physics, this wasn't a jokey, jokey thing, this was a book on physics. And he said, it's amazing to think that in some universe, there's a guy that wins the Euro lottery every week and he doesn't, <laughs> e and he doesn't even think it's weird. Right, right. I and mean, that's true. That's the implication of it. It's, it's very, 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 very strange in that sense. And in regards to, if we talk about Schrodinger's cat again, the, the idea that um, this, the, the decay there of the, of the particle and that this happens because of, are you saying by observing this or, do you think that it's yeah. enough with the awareness of that this is the case, so to speak, that the, that this is what is going on in inside the box, and only by just knowing that our awareness is enough to make the decision, uh, or, or is it strictly an observing act that goes now on this, here? This, if you read any books on particle physics these days, this is the big issue. The big issue is what constitutes observation. 
Is observation the object that does the measuring inside the box? Can the cat itself be an observer? Um, and the, 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 nobody's really been able to answer this question as to wh what constitutes an observer. But what is fascinating, and this is one thing that you might find amazing, is that you know that light can be a particle or a wave. Yes. And there's something called the twin slit experiment, whereby you fire a, um, uh, a light beam to, through two slits. And then the, and the light beam goes through and then a pattern is made on, uh, the, on something the other side of the two slits. Now, what is weird is that the light seems to travel as a wave and it arrives as a particle, which sounds very, very odd. And what they tried to do is in order to try and see whether it's a wave or a particle or not, they placed a sensor or they place a sensor in the two slits to, or to spot. Uh, you were you were just talking about the the, the twin slit experiment, and so maybe you can just do a quick uh, recap on that and 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 proceed. Okay, the the twin slit experiment it's the, to do with the duality of of light waves, and in fact, it's not just the duality of light waves. They've now discovered that even molecules have this duality, which is even weirder, which have massive implications for the nature of reality. But if you have two slits. And you and behind the two slits, you have um, uh, a board that, that can you can reflect the two slits out. What they do is they if you fire one photon at a time through the light uh, through the two slits, what you find is that even a single photon will go through both slits at the same time, even though it's one photon, which, of course, is impossible. But that's what it does. The only alternative could be that it's a wave, in which case a wave would go through both slits. So in order to test it out, what has been done is you place um, a measuring device or a counter or something of that nature at one of both the slits to see whether which one the particle goes through. If it is observed, the particle ceases to be a wave and becomes a particle and goes through one slit or the other. If you put the monitor away and turn it away, it goes through as a wave. So in which case the particle knows whether it's being observed or not and decides whether to be a wave or a particle. Mm. Now, this is really freaky stuff. And it's if you start thinking about this, you really start to get rather worried about the nature of what we call reality. Yes. Um, in, in fact, you know, sort of um, many particle physicists have, have said, you know, this is just completely doesn't make any sense because our brains can't understand it because the amazing thing is this idea of whether it's a particle or a wave there's been work done now in in switzerland with things called buckyballs and buckyballs are large molecules and these large molecules only become solid molecules when somebody observes them when they're not observed they're waves hmm. which means that reality if this is correct, and they've got no reason to think otherwise, unless they take the many worlds interpretation, is that when you are not looking at something, it's not there. <laughs> it just it it is a wave of probability, and, and this is mind blowing stuff. And and in one sense, then would you would you tie this back to the brain again, and and and, and consider that the brain is. Um, the mechan mechanism or the machine or the computer that kind of interprets this or make it manifest in a way that, that it's through our participation in this, um, you know, game or, or this chance play that we're in, involved in here that it becomes manifest at that instance where when we are aware of it. Is that? Is yeah, that, is that... spot on. Hmm. You, a, a physicist called Eugene Wigner, I think it was. Um, I think it was Wigner. It could have been John Wheeler. No, it was John Wheeler. And John Wheeler came up with the idea, called it the participatory universe. And the participatory universe is the, ma the, the idea that matter is brought into existence by mind. In fact, Wheeler, and I can't go into in detail now, but I do have a section of this on my blog site. Wheeler actually has postulated that we, by act, an act of observation, not only bring in the reality around us, but bring into existence things that happened millions of years ago. And he does an experiment and he shows an experiment that could be done that would prove that we, by an act of observation, bring a quasar into existence whose light left millions of years ago. Hmm. 
<laughs> from the quasar. Um, it's something called gravitational lensing, which I haven't got time to go in for now, but I do deal with this. Mm. But your, your point about the brain bringing about reality, there's some fascinating work being done at the moment by a guy called Professor Stuart Hammerhoff at the University of Arizona. And he's been working closely with an English philosopher called Roger Penrose. And Penrose and Hammerhoff believe that they have found within the brain the, 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 the structures that collapse the wave function within the brain to bring about our individual realities. And these things are called microtubules. And microtubules are so tiny that they believe that the act of consciousness, and they believe this is where consciousness starts. Consciousness is a quantum effect. Now, there is a big argument about these Hammerhoff, the, the Hammerhoff Penrose argument. And a lot of critics have said that the brain is too hot and too warm and too moist for these things to happen. But it's only a question of, of trying to find out how it, whether it can happen in these conditions, because the logic works. It's, it's called orchestrated reduction. Mm -hmm. I think it's orchestrated reduction. And it's the fact, again, I, all, I say to all your, your, your listeners, don't take my word for any of this I'm talking about. Check it out on the web. Make a note of the things I'm saying and just go on the web and do a search. It's all there and it's all hard science. Mm. It is absolutely amazing, this stuff. The problem is um, that what is happening is the neurologists aren't talking to the physicists and the physicists aren't talking to the philosophers mm who aren't talking to the psychiatrists, who aren't talking to the historians or the theologians. And then there's me in the middle going, hey, guys, I'm yeah. this little guy over in Liverpool, and I've pulled all this together, mm. and it works. Mm. You know, this, this really seriously, and I know it sounds incredibly vain, but it, other people have said this as well, this is singularly the most powerful theory that has been put forward for years. You know, it is just a question of how many people get to know about it. And and the question is again, is is this something? Um, I mean, how does how have your thoughts around this started to, to develop uh, in regards to how this can be, I guess, applied to the world that we do find ourselves in? Does this to to you mean that we can change everything? Can we affect this? Can we, by consciousness alone, then start to um, affect the reality around us and 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 play with it on a more conscious level? Or what do you think? I think we can. Um, at the moment, I have the, the amount of people who are joining in with me on this staggers me. Um, I've, got, I've got the most amazingly interesting people from a, a Buddhist monk who came over from Australia to see me about the theories and the implications for Buddhism. Um, I've been invited to a Sufi monastery in northern Cyprus because the Sufis, the mystic tradition of Islam, are interested in what I'm doing. Um, People who are involved in deep meditation are fascinated by it all as well. All these things are being pulled together in the most powerful way. And it, it clearly, it's a question, we, we've made the first few steps. And that's why I have a forum and that's why I have a, a blog site. Because I'm inviting people to join us on this. This is an adventure and, and it's open to everybody. I want people involved. I want, I mean, for instance, we were discussing earlier about I'm going to be interviewed by Whitley Strieber in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, Whitley's come across my theories from other people. But effectively, again, what happened to Whitley Strieber, I can explain. It's to do with temporal lobe epilepsy, because that's the other area I haven't talked about. I have a whole neurological theory. I have a theory about neurology that can possibly explain migraine, temporal lobe epilepsy, schizophrenia, bipolar. I've got medical professionals interested in this at the moment. Hmm. Um, I've got temporal lobe epileptics that I, I, I deal with who there's one guy on my forum, for instance, that's been on recently. He's got TLE, temporal lobe epilepsy. He's deja vuing hours in advance. He's living in a deja vu where he's fallen out of time. We're trying to help him at the moment because he's finding it so hard to deal with. I have pe people who have, like we were talking about Rick Strassman, weren't we, and the DMT, the spirit molecule. Yes, yes. My theory ties into his beautifully. 
Mm. You know, um, Rick and I are in contact and we're, we're swapping emails at the moment. Um, and, and regards, if we talk a little bit more about uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, is that yep. is it uh, because of some kind of uh, chemical imbalance that this means that the person is then jumping back and forth in regards to these different realities? Or how do you interpret this? Is this an error or is this meant to be? Is this the experience that they're having? Because uh, some of these people are actually trying to, well, through their experiences, they're actually learning and figuring, figuring out the re- yeah. uh, nature of reality, right? Yeah, it's meant to be. Effectively, I would argue that people that don't have temporal lobe epilepsy, they experience it. Now, anybody out there that has temporal lobe epilepsy will know these things because I have temporal lobe epileptics that end up at my talks and don't even know why they're there. Hmm. And I argue that the reason for this is that I argue that the, the, there are two sides to the brain, right and left hemisphere. Well, I don't argue that's a known fact. And the two sides of the hemisphere, are, uh, two hemispheres are joined together by something called the corpus callosum. Now, what I suggest is that the, 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 the daemon, the higher self, inhabits one part of the brain and the everyday self inhabits the, non, the dominant hemisphere, ordinarily in most of us, the left side. Now, the corpus callosum is the, mech- is the thing that holds the two sides of the brain together. There is another thing underneath, but that's irrelevant, really. It's just the main thing that holds the side of the brains together. Now, what I argue is that depending upon the chemical makeup within the brain of an individual will depend on the communication channels across the corpus callosum between the edelon and the daemon. And I I suspect, although I need to talk to Rick Straussman about this, because I think it could just as much be DMT. But effectively, there's another neurotransmitter in the brain called glutamate. And I think that glutamate facilitates communication between the daemon and the edelon. Mm. There's a famous term used by William Blake called the doors of perception. Yes. And in, in fact, it was the term the American band, the doors named themselves after. And William Blake said, if the doors of perception were, were flung open, man would see the universe as it is infinite. And what I argue is that when you have initially, I call it the, the continu- continuum of, 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 um, of creativity or transcendental transcendentalism. And what I suggest is that depending on how much of these chemicals you have in your brain will depend on how wide the doors are open, how wide the communication channels are. And I suggest that most normal people, and I'm using that just as a statistical majority, the doors are closed. They don't experience deja vu. They don't experience the daemon. They don't experience precognition. They don't experience the magic of what the universe is really about. Mm. But as the chemicals start to kick in, the doors start to become slightly ajar. And I think when the jaws are slightly ajar, that's that's classical migraine. And if you there's a wonderful book written by a guy called Oliver Sacks about migraine. And if you read that book, he tells you and I know I'm a migrainer and I can agree with this totally that you start to perceive reality in a slightly different way when you have migraine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, you have these, your, your, your eyesight starts to break down. You start to feel peculiar. You have a migraine aura. And part of the migraine aura is, is, is deja vus, standard deja vu sensations. I feel I've been here before. However, as the, the chemicals become stronger and there's more of them, the doors become more open. And that's temporal lobe epilepsy. Because with temporal lobe epilepsy, I don't know if you know about t- temporal lobe epilepsy, but Ordinarily, somebody who has pure TLE only has absences. They have petty mal. They don't, they don't have grand mal seizures where they, they fall up to the floor. Okay. All they do is they stare at you for a second. And the interesting thing is, and temporal lobe epileptics have told me this time and time again, if you're, if you're talking to a temporal lobe epileptic and they go into a pe- petty mal seizure, they'll just stare at you for a split second. They're away for hours. Hmm. They're absolutely away forever. Um, one of my one of my individuals turned around to me and she said when that happened to her the first time she was away for what felt like seven or eight hours and it was literally 0.5 of a second as far as her friend was concerned Mm. and the world she saw when she was there was frozen in time everybody around her had frozen she thought that somebody had just suddenly switched off and 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 taken a photograph of everything around her do you know if she could she could she like walk around and, and, and look at different things or how what's the nature of this? 
Well, this was weird. What, there's an interesting story to this. Um, I, I call the lady Margaret purely and simply for her own protection. Um, but she phoned me up one day um, because I normally work as a management consultant and she was working for a recruitment consultancy. And she phoned me up and she said, Tony, um, are you looking for a job at the moment? And I said, well, no, I'm not because I'm writing a book. And she said, what about? And I said, well, don't really know where I'm going with it at the moment. But at the moment, I'm reading a lot about temporal lobe epilepsy and it sounds quite fascinating. She went really quiet and she said, hmm, need to need to meet up with you. And I was living down in Horsham in West Sussex at the time, down in the southeast of England. And I arranged to meet her near Gatwick Airport in a hotel. And she walked in, Margaret, and she sat down and she said, the reason I needed to speak to you was that um, I've recently been diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. And everything you were saying to me is actually what is happening to me. Mm. So I turned around to her and I said, can you explain exactly what happened to you? And she said, I was in a canteen at work. And my friend was sitting opposite me and she was about to pour a cup of tea. As my friend went to pour the cup of tea, I felt a snap over my left ear. Right ear, I should say, snap over her right ear. She then looked at her friend and her friend had frozen. She'd frozen in place. Margaret could hear a low humming noise all around her. And then she looked at her friend and she realized that her friend hadn't frozen but she was moving incredibly slowly. Mm. And then she looked around everybody else in the room and they were all doing the same. And then she realized to her absolute horror that the humming sound she could hear were people talking. Her metabolic rate had gone to such an extent that she'd fallen out of time. She said she was there for hours and hours and hours watching her friend pour the cup of tea. She then feels another snap over her ear and her friend starts moving again, sits back and looks at her and says, are you OK? She'd been away for 0.5 of a second. She, Margaret turned around to me and she said, you know, that could have been my whole life. I could have been in that fugue for the whole of my life. And that was a very important point because that's what's built. What there was the first comment that built my whole theory up because I thought she could have been away for our whole lifetime in a split second. Yeah. Can you? Could a temporal lobe epileptic live their whole life in a split second? Do, and the you, answer is yes, they could. And do you know what what brings them into the state and and back again? Can this be con controlled, if you know what I mean? Um, they, well, uh, the irony is that many temporal lobe epileptics, it can be tr controlled by drugs. Mm. But many temporal lobe epileptics I'm in conversation with don't like it. Um, there's one lady who's had part of her temporal lobes cut away in a, a very radical operation. Um, to, to stop the seizures and she feels that something's been taken away from her because these guys are precognitive. Mm. The, 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 there is a t I don't know if you know that there is a term used for people who have temporal lobe epilepsy historically. It's called the diviner's disease. Oh, really? It's because, because they see the future. It really is incredible. You go through history and you look at all the major religious leaders of history most of them were diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy or it has been suspected. St. Paul on the road to Damascus, he sees a huge flashing light and he falls to the floor. It's a TLE seizure. Joan of Arc sees a flashing light and hears voices. It's a TLE seizure. Hmm. So many of these people, deeply religious, deeply profound individuals, or um, Swedenborg, you yes. know, one of your guys. Right. You look at Swedenborg's life. He had TLE. He he was precognitive. There was one famous event where he was miles away and he said there's a massive fire in Stockholm. And he was right. There was. And if you want to check this out, that really was a true story about uh, Swedenborg. Hmm. Because, because these guys can see the future. They know they can see the future. They, they tell me they can. The trouble is they, most of them can't communicate it. And the reason they can't communicate it, and this is fascinating, they turn around to me and they say, if I tell, and the one used the example, he said, imagine somebody's talking to me and I suddenly go into a, a deja vu type seizure. Oh, because I forgot to tell you that. Part of the pre-seizure aura of people who have TLE are profound, profoundly powerful deja vus. Okay. Precognitive mm. deja vus. Mm. Okay. Mm. So when they have these precognitive deja vu scenarios, I said to him, well, why don't you speak to the guy? He said, think about this. If somebody's just about to say something to me and I butt in and I say, you're going to say that, I'll change the future because that person won't say it anymore. 
And if I change the future, I'm in a different universe. And when the person said that to me, I said, bang, it's my theory. That's exactly <laughs> what would happen. And he doesn't want to change the future because he doesn't want the responsibility. So again, the, the theory fits. <laughs> now, what I then suggest is that when the doors are swung fully open, schizophrenia. Because schizophrenics, what's the classic about schizophrenics? They lose their ability to tell what time, what's happening with time, what's real, what's not. They see hallucinations. They see lots of things, which, again, is the DMT molecule that Rick Strassman talks about. It's because schizophrenia, it's, an, it's basically an Edelon who's seeing the world as a Damon Caesar. And it drives them literally insane. They can't handle it. They can't deal with it. Mm. And schizophrenics, I spoke to a young schizophrenic a few months ago at an organization called the Hearing Voices Network in Manchester. And he said, you're quite right about schizophrenia. And I said, why? And he said, well, you can believe this story or not. He said, but um, I lived in the same bedroom from the age of about seven or eight to the age of about 14 or 15. And he said, I was schizophrenic at the time and I had schizophrenia and everything else. And he said, for the whole time I was in the room, I'd never noticed before, but I went up to the bedroom one afternoon, one, one afternoon when I was 15, 16, and there was something different about my bedroom. I'd realized that for the whole of the time I'd been there, I'd been listening to this buzzing noise in my room. But you know when you hear a sound so regularly, it just becomes part of the background, yeah. and you only notice it when it stops. Right. This noise had stopped, and he couldn't understand what was happening. It goes dark later on that night, and he goes up to his bedroom to switch his light on. Didn't work. There'd been a power cut. He was hearing electricity in the wires. <laughs> Vincent van Gogh, it has long been considered that Vincent van Gogh had temporal lobe epilepsy or extreme schizophrenia. Starry, Starry Night, his famous painting, mm. they've done some analysis work on it recently. He was painting cosmic rays. Mm. Be he was be because he could, rays. Yeah, he could actually see it, right? Hmm. Yeah, because he could see it because his perception levels, he, his perception had moved on to the demonic, into the higher level. And I believe this is why people, when they do deep meditation, when they, 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 they develop themselves into higher levels of consciousness, they are opening up their channels of communication to their higher self, to their daemon, but they're doing it by training. Yeah, and it's basically what we can say is the, is the bandwidth of perception, meaning that we, we all it's all there around us all the time, Spot right? On. But only some people can access this and tap into it. And this is one of the things that I think uh, Strassman also has elaborated on, that yeah. if we take the DMT or, you know, whatever substance it is that actually makes the all the neurons in our brain active and we just can perceive so much more than we can normally, right? That's exactly it. And I totally agree with Rick. I mean, I've sent, I'm going to send him a paper in the next few days um, discussing why my theory supports his and vice versa. Mm. But what I suggest is the reason why the external world looks so odd to schizophrenics and everything is it's a hologram. Because the 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 Bohmian IMAX, this illusionary world, this three-dimensional brain-generated illusion that we exist in in the final moments of our life, according to my theory, it's generated by the brain using holographics. And as we know with a hologram, if you look at a holographic picture in using laser light, you see the three dimensional image, which is what we see. But if you take the laser light away, what you see is swirls. You know, it, it's not a picture at all anymore. And that's the real reality behind the reality, the illusion. For instance, do you know that if you break up, I don't know if you know about this, you know, you have a picture, a holographic picture. If you smash a holographic picture, you would naturally assume that the bits of the picture would be a, a bit of the picture. It's not. You smash a holographic image, you have the image itself in each of the bits. Yes. Okay? Yep. This is exactly what David Bohm, the particle physicist, argued is how reality works. Reality is like a big loop. Everything is inside everything else. It's what he calls the implicate order. You know, Richard Blake had the wonderful line to see heaven in a wild flower. Richard uh, Blake was a Gnostic, which is something I haven't even come on to yet. But effectively, again, he's because Blake was one of these guys that he had something strange with his brain that fills in my theory. I have a chapter on my net in my latest book on William Blake. Mm. And Blake is a classic example of how my theory works. 
The classic of all examples of my theory, by the way, is the Philip K. Dick, the American science fiction writer. And um, you know what, uh, Anthony, why don't we talk a little bit more about uh, Blake and Philip K. Dick in our next segment. I want to begin to round things up here for the first hour. And it is just so many points that you bring up that I want to talk more about. And I'm glad you mentioned the holographic idea as well, because that was something I wanted to get, in, get into as well. But let's elaborate a little bit more on this. I want to ask you a little bit more in the next segment about I guess uh, the kind of the weirdness of it all as well. Um, you mentioned with Liz Reber briefly, we can potentially talk more about the abduction phenomena or uh, going to synchronicity as well. So we have tons, tons more oh, of the stuff talking about here. But uh, to wrap things up here for the first uh, segment, Anthony, please mention your website again, uh, the, the two books that you have available. And I guess uh, people can uh, find and get copies of those on your website. Is that correct? No, you can, you can get them anywhere. You can, you can either order them directly from me off the website which helps me. But you can also most bookshops um, in America and in the US and uh, USA, Canada and across the world. Uh, the book, the, definitely the first book, which is called Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When You Die, which gives you the theory and the background that is available from most bookshops. It's available on Amazon. Um, it's been translated into Dutch. It's been translated into Polish. It's about to go into Spanish. Um, it's about to go into Russian. Um, so there, there are options. And I'm hoping that there might be a Swedish deal in the offing as well at the moment, which is quite exciting. Um, so that's called Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When You Die. If you buy it off my website, I'll send a signed copy. Um, and my website is anthonypeak.com. That's Anthony with an H and Peak, P-E-A-K-E. -E. Um, also on that website, please join in because I have a forum. I want this forum to be the biggest, most exciting forum on the web. It's building up to become that way. We've got some very interesting people. For instance, we now have Philip K. Dick's widow, Tessa Dick, is on there. We've got particle physicists such as F. David Pete. We've got um, neuroscientists. We've got the world's leading experts on deja vu on there, Vernon Nepe and Dr. Arthur Funkhauser. Powerful guys. Join us on there as well. So the website, again, is www anthonypeak.com. The second book is called The Daemon, A Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self. This is available at the moment in Europe and, we'll hope, and it can be ordered in America on Amazon or again directly from myself. And I'm quite happy to sort of sign the copies and send them anywhere in the world as well. Yeah, if anybody's interested, um, I've been invited over to America uh, for the first time to do a series of talks in New York and New Jersey. Um, and on the evening of the 3rd of August, I will be at the Roosevelt Hotel on Fifth Avenue um, doing an evening talk. And we, we do have a, a buffet afterwards and everybody is welcome to come along to that. And then the next day, on the 4th, I'm at Furley Dickinson Hall, at, uh, no, Furley Dickinson University uh, in New Jersey, um, where I'll be doing another talk um, for the um, Association of pra American Association of Practical Philosophers. Now, there's a nice irony about this because the hall I'll be doing the talk is the hall that they filmed uh, the movie A Beautiful Mind, which is, of course, about uh, a schizophrenic. So it, it's rather ironic that that's what I'll be doing my talk anyway. But effectively, you're invited along. There's going to be some very, very interesting people there, including a guy that's coming along to meet me who has got this brand new mathematical. Th he's got the maths that backs my theory up. He's a Ph.D. mathematician and he's applying the maths to um, Everett's Many Worlds interpretation, and applying it to my theory. I'm so honored that somebody at that level is even involving himself. That is the power of this stuff. Beautiful. So again, it's anthonypeak.com. We will have this link up on redhousecreations.com uh, so you can find it easily. And uh, Anthony's uh, blog as well, so you can follow along in some of his uh, updates. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to round things up here for the first segment. Uh, thank you again, Anthony, for coming on. We're going to continue talking more in our member section. Uh, stay with us and we will be right back. We will talk more with Anthony Peake in our member section, and uh, this is a program that you don't want to miss. We'll uh, continue to elaborate on the construct of reality. Uh, we'll talk about synchronicity, more on the uh, daemon, uh, balancing of our two brain halves, uh, precognition in dreams and in real life. Uh, Anthony is also going to tell us about his um, near-death experience, or rather how he avoided 
to have a near death or even death experience because of a song uh, on his MP3 player. Uh, really, really strange story. Interesting as well, of course. Uh, we'll also discuss Philip K. Dick, William Blake, J.B. Priestley, John William Dunn, and the weirdness of time and manipulation of reality. So head on over to our website, redicecreations.com, R-E-D-I-C-E, creations.com, and uh, click on members to tune in or s- click on subscribe to sign up and get instant access to our members area. You'll get full access to our radio archive, our extended interviews, video interviews, webcasts, and films. We'll take a short break right here, listen to some music, and then we'll be back with more for Red Eyes members. <laughs> 